move. This is the beginning of Wings 2015-2016. We over the, over the academic year here. Uh, Wings of Knowledge is a program every month, sometimes two. Sometimes we have a gap of almost a whole six weeks, but this is our first for the fall. And we have a mixed bag of programs coming up. We have uh, Randy Pierce coming up, and provided he made it to Mount Kilimanjaro, and we have TDLE up here. Good, okay. <laughs> He's the guy who's flying his dogs and climbing up to the jar. We have him coming up in December, and I'm glad he's finally with us. And we're actually going to the dogs next time. We're, we're going to be becoming Wolf uh, with Chris Chandler on the uh, November 3rd. But tonight we have a special program. My name's Stu Wallace. Uh, I teach history here. This is history, um, sort of, as far as the Mayans are concerned. Um, and this is a special program because, well, first of all, the Mayans are kind of interesting. We didn't know much about them at all until we started finding these ruins. But this is something that, that is, is, we have to look up for this one. This deals with the Mayan sky and what they thought about all that stuff up there and, and why it's working the way it did. And our special guest today is R.P. Hale. Now, R.P. Hale, and I'm sure you've actually run across people with this exact label before, is an archaeo astronomer, historian, musician, calligrapher, chemist, teacher, and musical instrument maker. If you can guess what musical instruments he makes, you get special credit for tonight. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you <laughs> cheated. <laughs> Arky has done many wonderful things. In fact, there's some calligraphy of his in my own office uh, when I left as director of the planetarium many years ago, and I treasure it. Um, and, and it's a special to have him here because I have no idea where he's going to go with this, none whatsoever. Um, he is probably, for all I know, going to predict another end of the world or at least poo poo anybody who does. Remember that, was it the like, Two, three years ago, there was this guy who sold a book and he predicted the end of the world, probably number 7,497 in world Western history civilization, to predict the end of the world. And uh, I, I had a, a distant cousin who was a real sucker for that stuff, so she bought this guy's book. That's the first part of being a sucker. And she gave it to me, telling me it was the world coming to an end. And so I held on to the book until the day after. The world did not come to an end. I thought I could leave that suspense. And I never did tell the library staff here, but I place that book in the uh, book drop, discount, whatever. <laughs> I not to the library. I have no idea. You probably threw it out. R.P. Hale is going to talk to us about the Mayan sky and calendar. Um, and as I said, I have no idea what R.P. is going to do. So I'm going to turn it over to him. R.P., you're Thank up. You. Um, I'm about an attendant sheet. If you're here, would you please be so kind as to sign it? We always like to have an idea who's here. Don't worry, you're not going to be. So, uh, you know, NSA will not be asking you for this, but we always like to know who comes here. So just let us know who you are and whether you're a student, faculty, visitor, whatever. Well, I wish you told me because I don't know where I'm going with this. Right. So, <laughs> so as, the, as far as the end of the world is, I'll give you the astronomer's answer. So what you want to do is set your alarms for, uh, for six billion years hence. Exactly. Or, or uh, plus or minus a couple hundred million years. We're not quite sure. I mean, every calculation on the volume of hydrogen versus helium conversion within the sun, every, <coughs> this is one of my, I teach ast astronomy at St. Paul's, and that's one of my project problems. Every student has given me a different answer every single year, but it lies within the range of six billion years from now, plus or minus 122 million years or so. So uh, yeah, set your alarm for a general. Wake me up while you're at it. We'll get a bloody good show of the sun entering red giant phase. Now that's end times. Tr trouble is, these uh, wackos, they don't want to wait that long for some reason. I'm perfectly willing to wait that long. I don't know about you. So actually, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna, we're going to explore some of the math. Now, before you cringe, um, I was very lucky in my math teachers. Uh, they taught me how to use it, even that blasted calculus stuff. And you, never, and you didn't hear me say that. So, um, um, and, but all those horrible classes and semesters, uh, my, my academic background is in organic chemistry. I've got a bachelor's and a master's in it. I am working on a doctorate right now in archaeoastronomy archaeo slash Mesoamerican studies slash Maya. And, because uh, I don't have enough to do. And, um, all those horrible math sessions came back and bit me because I'm getting, because now I'm really getting smacked in it because I had to go, of all things, and work on the bloody calendars. 
So, I mean, I couldn't do straight archaeology or anything like that. No, I mean, let's go into some self-abuse here. So, um, I'm going to take, I'm going to start out first with the date December 22nd, 2012, the day after. Um, I had fought the New Age for 22 years over that one. And a fellow from the Boston Globe calls me on the 22nd of December, because and, and, I'd been feeding them articles and stirring up all sorts of trouble with the Harvard-Smithsonian Observatory and so on, uh, positive trouble. And uh, the interview went, uh, you know, this, that, and the other. And they finally, are you sorry this is over? I said, no. Well, maybe I am. Oh, what are you regretful? What, what are you regretting about it? He said, well, I found out I am on most of the New Age enemies lists. Well, that's too bad. I'm sorry to hear that. I said, yeah, so am I. I didn't reach my goal. I wanted to be on all of them. So, oh well. And uh, basically the whole thing came down to this is what happens when you pick a fight with an Aztec and lose. So don't worry, I don't have an obsidian knife here. So you're all safe. And we've, get, we've given up most of our nasty habits quite a long time ago. But as I mentioned at school, I won't tell you which ones we kept. All right, so why don't we, OK, that is, OK. Oh, hit the one on the right. OK. So um, there are, we know of about 870 cultures in Mesoamerican history and counting. There are some 586 of them still existing in Mexico, Central America. And, but everybody knows the Maya and the Aztec. What a lot of people don't realize is that the Maya were divided into 32 separate groups, each one somewhat able to talk, which it, I mean, we're talking about 30 different languages, uh, 32 different languages. And in other words, a, uh, a Kakichel Maya from Guatemala could not talk to, could not converse with the Yucatec Maya from the Yucatan. And um, on top of that, um, you know, they're, uh, at their peak, there must have been, a, we figure there were about 35 million of them all divided, and all warring with each other. I mean, the Maya made my Aztec ancestors look like kindergartners when it came to blood, guts, death, misery, and all that good stuff. And um, I mean, they played balls with people's heads. Um, ball games were literally elimination rounds. That's what happened to the loser, sacrificed, and other very pleasant things. But they were in constant war with each other. And um, however, while warring, they were developing all these cultural attributes as well. And um, one thing they did is they beat out everybody with time scales. And uh, I mean, the longest, time the longest single discrete time scale we know of in Maya archaeoastronomy is a time period of over 72 um, octillion years. That's 72 followed by 30 zeros. And, um, all right, so I'm 18th century. This is a devil's instrument. All right, there we go. And they did not disappear. There's still 16 million of them. Uh, speaking 30 languages, we lost two on the way. And um, however, Mesoamericans, not the Maya, but Mesoamericans, the Olmec, Epi Olmec, and Zapotec were the first to use, devise, and use the number zero. And in all the Maya languages, in fact, zero is a verb that can be conjugated. I mean, that's really getting metaphysical now. OK. So um, the other thing is, we are in the second renaissance. And what that means is that every single one of us who are involved in these studies had to trash almost every damn thing we learned before because it was all wrong. And that's what happens when you go from knowing 12% of the glyphs and in a 15-year period, knowing almost all of them. We're still uh, deciphering some that we don't know about. And glyphs do vary somewhat. But the interesting thing about it, it's like Chinese. The glyphs, no matter what group you were in, the glyphs were common. They may have slightly different pronunciations, slightly different um, meanings, uh, slightly different language inflections. But they were in common. And in fact, I myself right now, Everybody in Maya studies now learns Chol Maya. That's the, langu that's the original language of the glyphs. It's hell. And I thought we were going to have an easy ride because of my knowledge of the Aztec language, but uh-uh, no, this is different. 
And then, because I'm working with the southern, the southern Maya, the uh, Palenque, Tikal, Kaminahuyu regions, I am learning Cholti, which is the modern version of Chol. So I don't sound like a bloody fool when I'm down there with the locals. Or I only sound like half a bloody fool when I'm down there, instead of a total one. And uh, the one thing I have learned to ask in about eight of the Maya languages is the polite way of, do you please do you speak Spanish? <laughs> so uh, uh, never ask about English. OK. Um, where were they? Well, the, uh, Sapo by the way, the Sapotec are still with us. Uh, they speak one of the oldest languages in the Western Hemisphere. They've been there for over 6,000 years. They also account for one-third of Mexico's presidents uh, over the, uh, since 1820. And, uh, well, Benito Juarez is the most famous one. Um, Emiliano Zapata was another. He wasn't a president, but he was very famous. Um, the Olmec were centered in far south Mexico into uh, Guatemala, Guatemala seceded from Mexico right after Mexico seceded from Spain, and they're still arguing over that one. Uh, the Maya pretty much dominated the Yucatan all the way into the central, central Petén region, all the way down to nearly uh, Panama. And there was an enclave of them centered around the city of Te Teotihuacan. We don't know what kind of Maya because um, we don't know who they were, and we, we have to use the Aztec name because we don't know what the name of that city was either. Uh, one thing we're not finding at Teotihuacan are glyphs, which is very, very interesting. So, uh, boy, I wish, they'd, I wish they'd thought about that before they burned the place down. Okay, and uh, some of the cities. Uh, my region of operation is in here, between Palenque and Tikal, centered around Palenque. And this is where the flatlands meet the high mountains. So it's not, I mean, it can be pretty miserable in the summer. And that's when I would prefer to go because I don't have to worry about tourists. You just have to worry about mosquitoes, mo uh, poisonous snakes, and things like that. Um, but don't go there in winter, or you, won't, or you can't get through the crowds. Um, the uh, northern regions, uh, of course, the very famous uh, Chichen Itza, Ushmal, Koba. And then the central, the uh, Kalakmul, Tik, uh, Tikal, uh, La Venta, Palenque region, and then, then to the south we get down into Kaminahuyu and Kirihua and Isapa, which is one of the oldest sites. The Isapa is not a Maya site, it is an Epi-Olmec site. And, um, but the Maya took it over when they started dominating. And uh, toward the end, just before, now by the way, I did not grow up in South Tucson learning about the Spanish conquest. I learned about la invasión, the invasion. And um, so just prior to the invasion, I told you we had long memories, um, just prior to the invasion, the orange is the extent of the Aztec Empire. In Sem Anahual Mexica. They were really called the Mexica, and that's where the word Mexico comes from. And the green area is pretty much where the Maya had uh, pretty much confined themselves. And you may notice also from the map that there is no contact. The Maya and the Aztec only met through intermittent merchant trips. And um, the Maya knew full well that the Aztecs conquered by merchants. They would send merchants into new towns. And if the merchants didn't come back, then they sent an army. And however, we're getting into really nasty thick jungle here. and. Um, Plus, the Maya were as fierce as they ever had been. And um, they would uh, receive the, Aztec, uh, the intermittent Aztec um, merchant or paramerchants and then treat them nicely and then escort them to their respective borders and politely and firmly tell them, uh, Ching Juan Anampa, don't come back. And uh, they didn't. <laughs> so um, uh, plus, uh, this region here, uh, which is almost centered around, well, I mean, Palenque, this gray area here, that was also called the, uh, that was also called Sem Nanahuali, the sick zone. People who get, went in there tended to get cholera and all sorts of nasty things. So um, this was actually a buffer zone between the Aztecs and the, and the by then 30 Maya groups. 
This area was conquered entirely by foot. There were no horses, no draft animals, no wagons, no wheels. And the capital, Tenochtitlan. Okay. All right. Now the math. Um, they use three characters in their mathematics. All the Mesoamerican cultures um, use but three characters. They had a dot and a bar and a zero. Now, by the time the Aztecs dominated from the 12th century on, they had lost the zero. But they were still using dot and bar. But a dot is one unit, and a bar is five. And we think it was either hand signals or sticks and stones. And by the way, they didn't count by 10. They counted by 20. We have 10 integers in our Arabic system from 0 to 9. And that, however, they have 20 integers from 0 to 19. And all their math is multiplied, added. All calculations are by 20, not by 10. And so here are the, uh, here are the, the basic 20 integers. Um, Bishbal in the Yucatec language means in process of. It is, going from some, it is going from somewhere to somewhere. In this case, it is going from nothing to something. And by the way, there were no fractions. In other words, the, be the best way to describe the Mesoamerican concept of zero is simply to ask, we've all driven to Boston, right? Have you arrived in Boston before you got there? That's a nasty question, isn't it? In other words, if it's 70 miles to Boston, if you covered 60, are you there yet? No, <clears throat> which is also, by the way, why the year 2000 was not the millennium. It was the last year of the previous one, because 99 cents does not make a dollar. So, so and these are the uh, most of us still pretty much use the Yucatec, um, the Yucatec um, names for the numbers. Although I was told recently I had to learn how to count in chol, but oh well. Um, We'll see what that does. All right. So now um, it was we uh, we're pretty sure that it was all addition and subtraction. Multiplication was implied. Division never. There were no fractions. In other words, you either had a whole ear of corn or you didn't. If you broke that ear of corn, you had two you had two smaller pieces. That was as close as they could get to the concept of a fraction. And to this day, no Maya language has a word that means half, quarter fifth, eighth, third. Um, and uh, they divide by, they multiply by adding. Uh, so uh, what's that number, by the way? Eight. Oh, three. Three. three plus five. equals? Eight. See, a five plus three, right? And uh, what's that last integer on the second one? 17. 17. 17. OK. And now we've got, um, OK, we have 11 minus what equals what? OK. All right, now, that's all very well and good if you're from 0 to 19, but what have we, what have we got now? 18 plus, two. 18 plus 2. Notice that there's no integer for 20, right? In other words, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, we add a place to the left, don't we, to make 10, right? They do the same thing, except they go up. That's what they do. So instead of, the, instead of times 10, so 20 is simply a single dot over the zero symbol. So this is a 1 times 20 plus 0 times 1 equals 20. And yes, you do, when, you, when you deal with these kind of numbers, you have to think that way. And uh, by the way, that is not foreign thinking. I'll bet none of you knew that we do this all the time with our Arabic numerals. So. Um, you know, so 22 is 1 times 20 plus 2 times 1, right? Yep. And um, 40 is 2 times 20 plus 0. 100 is 5 times 20 plus 0. See how it works? Now, do you think it's going to stop there? No. no way. It goes. There is no end to this system. We do not know if they knew about negative numbers. I wouldn't be surprised if they did, but we have no evidence. But once you start, if the starting place is given to be bishbal or zero, is there an end of the system? There is not. And um, three-place numbers. So the lowest three-place number is 400. 
So we, we, ha we now have 20 times 20. Instead of, in other words, 1, 10, 10 times 10, 10 to the third. Same thing. So we have uh, 400 times 1 plus 0 plus 0. And you see how the pattern develops. Here we have 400 plus 100, you know, 5 times 20 plus 0. The largest three, three place integer is 19, 19, 19, or, uh, and it, as you can see how it builds up. So what do you think 8,000 will be? How about a dot over a zero, over a zero, over a zero, right. Yeah, and um, people think I'm patronizing them with this until, until with my classes I start, okay, now we're going to look at some slides that I took in Palenque and you're going to date them for me. And then you're going to convert them. I won't do that to you. Um, I didn't have the hand. However, don't go looking for quadratic equations in base 20. <laughs> Although I have been known to punish uh, recalcitrants at St. Paul's by, okay, boy, tomorrow, and I want it in, and I want it in um, dot and bar. So don't don't mess with me if you know what's good for you. So, uh, all right. Now instead of doing dot and bar, I mean I do have an app on my computer that allows me to work in dot and bar, but it is so much easier. To, uh, if we go Arabic, because we're used to that. We have to remember that we are still dealing in base 20. So the least value is over to the right always, and it increases to the left. So here we have times 1, times 20, times 20 squared, times 20 to the third, times 20 to the fourth. And we also leave a period, so it, another, this is not a Star Trek star date, by the way. Um, <laughs> And the other convention is to, leave a, is to leave a space right after the period. And that's kind of convention, so we don't mistake it for something else. And um, so this, this represents a five-place dot and bar. So we would, this one would be represented by two bars and two dots, over three bars and two dots, over two dots, over the zero symbol, over a bar and four dots. But it's so much easier to visualize it this way. <clears throat> As I said, we do it all the time and don't realize it. This is how I was taught the factor. And I was very lucky in my math teachers. This Arabic number simply means, doesn't it mean just that? So, uh, and actually this is a slide that saves most of my classes. Because once, once they see this, they, you see a lot of head palming and oh my god, I said, Yes, but you're doing it by 20s, and don't ever forget that. Woe to the one who forgets that. So, all right. OK, so here we have um, some, I'll put, I'll put the answers up. I won't ask you to do them here. In other words, uh, addition. So we've got some, some one place, a couple two place, and a couple of three place. And that's what they are. That's what the, um, so there we have 26. and. Um, there we have a four-place number. All right. So as I said, no concept of fractions. It's rather unbelievable. But what they did, what they could do by simple addition and subtraction with implied multiplication was absolutely incredible. Um, in other words, we've got, we have two uh, significant numbers. 584, these are found in the Dresden Codex. Which is, an, which is the most famous surviving Maya almanac. 584 is a sidereal period of the planet Venus. In other words, if you look at Venus on a certain day and chart, it against, it, chart its position in the sky against the background stars, it will, re, it will return to that relative position in the sky at that time among those background stars that many days later. And everybody knows what 365 means, don't they? It's really 365 and a quarter. And they did, they did the, the Olmec discovered the leap year without fractions. They did it by addition. So we can express uh, these two numbers. Um, that is a very significant number in Maya numerology because of, it combines two time periods. But we can express it as either that or that. However, they didn't do that. 2,920 in, in, old, in old count was you had to add, you had to add 584 five times, or 
or 365 eight times. And on top of that, the five versus eight period is also very significant in, within the sidereal astronomical values of the, of the charting of the positions of the planet Venus again. Venus, in fact, was the most important celestial object, not the sun. The sun either preceded Venus in the sky or followed. And in fact, to most uh, early Maya, the sun was the sun of, of um, uh, Shemal, Venus. And uh, Venus, to all Mesoamericans, was a vicious, bloodthirsty god of war, blood, death, pestilence. And that white color, Mesoamerica, like China, white is the color of death. And um, so here we have, a, OK, five place number. Um, we, we don't count on the general public getting that right off the bat, but you certainly get that, don't you? It's an uh, Arabic conversion. And so how do we factor this number into our own base 10? Well, we do it by, by factoring out. So if this is 1 all the way up to 20 to the fourth power, well, 3 times 20 to the fourth power plus, plus, plus. See how it works? So in our Arabic notation, there's the value, base 10. Now I'm going to worry you right now by saying that they have two ways of counting. This is the trade count. It's pure base 20. The calendar count throws a variable in there. OK. So uh, OK, how do we go about adding this number to itself? Well, that's how we do it. Notice, you see how carrying happens here? OK. OK, um, 17 plus 17 is 34, but 34 is greater than 20, isn't it? So 34 less 20 is 14. Carry one up. 13 and 13 is 26, plus 1 is 7. Well, we have another 20, so leave the 7. Carry the 20. 6 plus 6 is 12, plus 1 is 13. 13 is less than 19, so we don't do anything with it. 10 plus 10, 0, carry up, and that's how it works. And uh, it actually does not take long to get used to this. You just have to remember that it starts at 0 and ends at 19. In fact, I'll tell my students, put a, make a placard and put it at your desk. Starts at 0, ends at 19. OK. Or if we do Arabic shorthand, we're doing exactly the same thing, aren't we? Yeah. So uh, we came up with the same value anyway. Yeah. Go back a slide. You were saying it starts at 0 and ends at 19. Yeah. So if you look at the bottom line, wouldn't you be moving up? Uh, wouldn't the remainder be um, 15? And you'd be moving up 19? Uh, no. No, it's from z we have 20 integers from 0 to 19. And 20 is the first two place number. OK. So, so we have to subtract 20. Uh, because, remember, we have well, that I was, symbol. I was following you until yeah. you said we only have 0 to 19. Yeah, well, zero to, 20 integers is 0 to 19. And just to say, it's exactly the same way we have 10 integers, 0 to 9. And um, all I can say is I am so glad these people never develop calculus. <laughs> all right. So um, this is the system of the long count calendar, which itself, is an, uh, which itself is a compendium of several calendars. And so um, the second, all, all, um, all values are multiples of 20, but the second lowest place in a, in a number cannot exceed the integer 17. And the third place is 20 times 18. Thereafter, it goes to 20. And uh, we'll come back to that in a little bit. Now. What we call the, uh, they're not the Maya calendars. They're the Olmec, Epi-Olmec, and Sapotec calendars. And, um, and um, they evolved much earlier. We're talking about 20, at least 2800 BCE, at the very least. And things were pretty well developed by then. So as far as I'm concerned, it pushes it back even further. And no, there were no damn aliens involved. <laughs> so. Uh, in other words, the Egyptians are around. They, they have a history of their ancient culture of over 5,000 years. Don't you think if you give a culture a chance to do, don't you think if you give a culture that long, it's going to do something? Yep. 
And they certainly did. The Chinese have a written history of 14,200 years. And they're, boy, are they still with us, too. So, all right. Uh, what they had because of latitude is what we don't have here. Because we so far know we will never see the sun at 90, 90, 90. Right? Uh, the highest we can see the sun is um, 90 minus 23 and a half degrees from uh, New Hampshire's latitude. So, uh, but we'll never see it directly overhead. And so what they did is they devised, they, uh, they used the sun, they counted by days. Everything is, is dependent upon the tun, the day, a day and a night. And, um, and then um, the next day, sunrise begins the next day into the night and so on and so forth. And so they used the sun as a marker. They noticed that twice a year, the sun would shine directly overhead. And what they did is they devised these gnomons, which is a tapered limestone cone with its head cut off, and a cap that's exactly the width of the base. And on any other day other than direct transit, there would be a little band, there would be a band of light across the base. When they saw no band of light at high noon, that was a day. Um, up to the, uh, when you reach the Tropic of Capricorn, this happens once a year. But as you go further south to the Tropic of, uh, I mean, the Tropic of Cancer down the Tropic of Capricorn, you, uh, within that entire region, 23 degrees north, 23 south, you can have a solar transit. Uh, there are still some of them used. This one is in the Esna, Yucatan, and it is fenced off. Now, in the old days, during the Mayan Empire, touching one of those and not being a priest earned you the death sentence. Nowadays, touching one of those and not being a Maya gets you 20 years in Mexican prison. I don't know which is worse. So you see one, um, do respect the fence, or you're going to be a guest of, uh, you're going to be a guest of the uh, Gobernador Federal for a while. OK. Um, Isapa sits on this latitude here, 14.5, and it has solar transits on, um, I believe it's, um, yeah, April 30th and August 13th. The latter day is the more important. And uh, Central Plaza of Isapa, this is from an old slide I had, to this day on the summer solstice, the 22nd of June, the mountain, uh, the sun appears to rise right out of that mountain. This city was astronomically sighted. And it was astronomically sighted um, before 2900 BCE, almost 5,000 years ago. So they were, there was already some uh, sophistication going on here. And this is the central plaza. And I was standing on a uh, two meter square platform that had to have been an original sighting platform. The to 260-day calendar, we think, arose, was codified, I mean, the 260-day calendar, we believe, was codified at Isapa. But um, we're not, uh, there are, and we're going to go into this. There are, the Maya calendar system is a whole series of interlocking wheels. It's worse than your grandfather's watch inside. OK. Uh, Tikal, one of my favorite places. And um, not just anybody is allowed to climb the uh, the pyramids, because those pyramids have a 62 degree slope on their staircases. And if you have any kind of vertigo or fear of heights, you may look, but you may not climb. They already knew that, uh, well, oh, you're the one that climbed ship's mast going up. And so I did. And coming down, boy, was that cool. I thought it was great. Um, I've, I started down facing forward, and then these steps the treads are that high, and they're that narrow. So I mean, yeah, they're they're about the yeah about half my foot could get on it, and of course they're worn, they're not pristine anymore, and they can get slippery. So about halfway down, I turned around, and started laddering it down. I said, okay, I've proven all I need to prove. So um, and these from Temple One, uh, the second tallest one, and the one in the main plaza. Um, the other, the other five temples that we see, three main ones and the spire of one further back, uh, the one, this one here, that's the tallest one. And these, uh, these represent, um, temp in other words, temple four, this fixes the 13 August sunset position. 
and as seen from this portal I'm standing in. Okay, and a map. Oh, yes, go that way. All right, so Temple 1, in other words, okay, to Temple 4, okay, sunset August 13th. If I'm looking from Temple 1 to Temple 3, that's sunset on the equinoxes. And um, looking from here to here, looking from Temple 4 to 3, sunrise on the winter solstice. So, yeah, the um, central, the, uh, the uh, central part of Tikal, which, by the way, is only 5% excavated, um, and it's huge. There must have been about 800, uh, there must have been about 80 to 90,000 people living there at its height, and, uh, which did the min in the end. So, uh, we're look and, uh, so we're looking at all these uh, different uh, orientations. And you also notice how these, each one of these structures is oriented exactly the same way. Every single one of them only Temple 1 to Temple 4, you can see, uh, does mark the sunset of August 13th, but can you see the common alignment of everyone? They're all aligned to August 13th. Most Maya cities are aligned to that. We're aligned to that at the beginning. Okay, calendar systems. There are several. There are many. So, um, and like the glyphs, the calendar system was common. Uh, it was one of the very, the glyphs and the calendar system were the only things that these cultures ever agreed on. They fought over everything else. And, um, and it's interlocking wheels. Now, it's interesting they developed wheels because there were no physical wheels. I mean, we have a lot of wheeled toys we've excavated, but if you don't have draft animals, what use is a wheel? They didn't have push carts either. It was all tump line, backpack, and carry, or get someone else to carry. So the shortest one is the Sokin, or the Sokin, and um, it's a 260-day cycle, and it arose at Isapa. So uh, two holy numbers, 13 and 20. There's a 13-day interval, and there's a 20-day interval. In fact, the 20-day interval is also referred to as a month. And when you mesh these two numbers, and in fact, I didn't bring that model, it's a great way of teaching the concept of lowest common denominator because students can play with it. Oh, OK. So if we want to see that, so we have these two wheels here. We have the symbol, the day symbol, ahau, and the uh, number symbol, eight. So these, wheel, this wheel rotate, this wheel, these two wheels rotate together. The big wheel has to turn 13 times, and the little wheel has to turn 20 times before we see this combination again. And if you know your factoring, the lowest common denominator of 13 and 20 is 260. And um, by the way, between August 13th and April 30th at Isapa is 260 days. And in other words, it varies depending on your latitude. And Isapa had two things going for it as far as the Maya were concerned. It was old. They loved old things. The older, the more sacred it was. It also had that fortunate latitude that allowed it to have a 260-day cycle between solar transits. So, <clears throat> and there's, a, there's, there's been an awful lot of bump built up and devised and invented about ISAPA, none of which is true. Um, I used to warn people in the year 2012, if you go down, if you go down to Yucatan, you go to visit the ruins, if you mention 2012, you're going to pay for it. If you mention it in a bar, it's guaranteed fight, and they don't play fair. What, what is the significance of 2012? It ended a period. However, the other thing that these people didn't realize about the Maya calendar is we have overlapping days. The last day of one month is, the first, is simultaneously the zeroth or seeding day of the second. The, so there's a day that, you know, when you end a month, there's a day, but it also begins the next one. So there's no beginning, and do circles have beginnings and ends? They don't. So now, we've got, um, what's, the, what's the significance of that time period? It's a standard solar year, isn't it? And, uh, but we always, we always write it out this way, because uh, the Mesoamerican year was 18 20-day months, and there are five days left over, called the unlucky period. 
So we call it the vague year because they also knew about the leap year. Okay. So the one key, one key in is one day, and 20 key in is a winal, and that's the month. And um, those are the day symbols. And then 18 winal equals one hop, almost, because 18 times 20 is 360. So then we've got all these months and five days left over. The Aztecs referred to those five days as the nemontemi, and anyone who was unlucky enough to be born in that five-day period, which corresponds to our 8th, 8th to 12th of February, was forthwith sacrificed. They didn't want any, they didn't want any of those lucky, unlucky people around. So people, if uh, adult uh, parents would actually lie about the kid's age that they were born in a nemontemi. Oh, no, 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 he was born on the last day of the old year. Or no, 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 he was born on New Year's Day. You can't take him. OK, and, um, and we also refer to. Um, yeah, six pulp or 15 yashkin, like eight, or today is 6 October, right? And um, so it's, it's the same thing, just about the same thing. Remember the uh, Sokin wheel? So if we mesh the 260-day wheel combination with, with the 365-day calendar, with the 365-day wheel, then we get the, dom the, the uh, common denominator of that number of days, which is exactly 52 solar years. 52 also happens to be 4 times 13. And no, I'm not Kabbalistic about it. So, so we have that symbol, that symbol, and that symbol. They will meet only once every 18,980 days. Doesn't stop there either. OK. No, okay, so here's the, this is the overlapping day. Remember the integers are 0 to 19, not 1 to 20? They're 0 to 19. So the zeroth day of the second month signifies the, end, the, signifies the end of the previous month whilst beginning the next one. That's why the 21st of December 2012 was both simultaneously a completion and a beginning. It ended, it completed a 400-year Bakhtun period. It initiated another 400-year Bakhtun period simultaneously. This is a concept we do not have in our calendar system. And uh, like there is no zeroth day of January, is there? De that's December 31st. So, so, so um, it belongs, to the, it belongs to, the, to the month it seats, but it really ends the other one, the previous one. OK, I went wrong way. OK. And now, remember that 584-day period, cycle of Venus? Now, if we, ended, if we added that to what we call the calendar round, the 52-year cycle, we now get a period of exactly 104 solar years. And um, so again, so if we, this, the, the first day of the sidereal period of Venus plus these five symbols, one, two, three, four, five, these will not, these, this combination will not happen for another, 140, another 104 years. So, um, so uh, yeah, the best way to illustrate this calendar concept is by tooth gears and meshing. And um, there's another wheel. We still don't know about it, but it figures it's repeated. It's referred to a lot, but what is it? We don't know. Um, it's based on color. Now these colors are, you look at, you, uh, you talk to any Diné or Navajo or Hopi or Apache or Yaqui or any indigenous Mesoamerican tribe, the color, each direction is a color. What color is north? That's the direction of death. To the Maya, that's where the deserts were. and You couldn't live too well in a desert. And what foxed the Maya was the fact that the Aztecs did live very well in the desert. So they referred to the Aztecs, in fact, those Maya that did meet them, as the people of the north, which was a slur. Um, well, west is black. That's when the sun goes down. Night comes. And the Chinese did not originate the east is red. The Olmec did. And yellow, the direction of south, because that is when the most favorable positions of the sun were seen. In, when it was in the south. And um, they saw the sun as white, but um, they, gave, they, didn't want to, they didn't want to assign the sun a death, uh, a death attribution, so they gave it the color yellow instead, not knowing that the sun is a G25 yellow dwarf. 
So, OK, so now we've got all these wheels. They're all meshing with, with them. This one meshes somehow. And whoever finds that out, I would say, is gonna, should be nominated for a Nobel. But um, we have the, uh, we got the short cycles. We've got the bundle of years. We've got Venus. And then we have the double cycle. And the calendar is actually very accurate. And the Maya made it even more accurate by, inter by adding intercalary days, which uh, we have an intercalary day every four years. It's called February 29th. OK. Now, we have another one, the long count. This is the, this is the, um, this is the one whose beginning is very long time ago and has no end. <clears throat> In fact, the, the uh, one, the uh, Chol term for zero is shimach, which means that which is there forever. And, and they also use it as a symbol to denote a very long time, which we can translate as eternity. OK. So um, we're using the same numbers, but now we've got dates. Dates are usually extremely formalized. And so you'll see that the number will precede, will either sit above or right next to the glyph representing these. Those glyphs represent time periods. And then here we have, here we have the, uh, the calendar round. This is the 360-day uh, cycle and the 260-day um, cycle. Then we have day times 20, the, uh, the, the tun. So the kin, we now tun, which is the 360-day cycle. Katun times 20, baktun times 400. And we also know, even with this symbol means, that's the, uh, in the, that's the determination symbol. That, means, that literally means this is a date. However, we also know that all numbers carved on Maya monuments are dates. So if we see any series of numbers, uh, if we see particularly any 5 plus 2 series of numbers carved on a Maya stella, it's going to be a date of some sort. If it's without this, it may refer to a date in the past not now or in the future. So it's now turning out that maybe they did understand the concept of the number line and going back and forward on it. So, so OK, we've seen this before. Lowest, uh, both systems, uh, trade count and calendar count, the lowest or the integer, the integer on the bottom or to the right is always the lowest, and it goes up, just like our system does. However. We have a, let's, uh, let's move over. Here we go. OK. So we have this date here. So um, here's the, um, there's the uh, 18,900 day cycle. And then we have, this is a, a kin is a day. A winal is a 20 day period. And then we have the tun. Now, this is, a, this is 20 times 18. You see that number? If it were 400, look at it this way. Which is closer to the value of a solar year, 400 or 360? 360. That is why they did that. And then it uh, resumes. So 1 times 20 times 20 times 18 times 20 again. And then we multiply by another 20. And we never see this 20 pattern interrupted ever again. So, um, so the, uh, this value. Since there are 18 months to a year, that value cannot exceed, eight, cannot exceed 17. When it goes beyond 17, it's got to carry over to the next place, just like what you did with the numbers in the pure vigesimal system. So there's the number in pure base 20. No interruption, right? Well, let's take it over here. OK, this same number, 20 times 18, 20 squared, 23rd times. In other words, that place there always figures. So instead of 3 times 400,000, it's um, 3 times 144,000, 10 times 7,200, so on and so forth. You see we have a lower value than we had with the one previous. So um, 562, 677 versus the calendar count 506, 437. Uh, I can say, remember, any, any five-place number that you see on a monument will be in the calendar count and in no other version, period. 
that's uh, standard. And you know, several million of these artifacts, not one of them refers to anything else. That, not one of these five place numbers refers to anything than a calendar count. So the number, in four, number 400, for example, pure base 20, a dot over two zeros. See how it factors out in the calendar count? Zero plus two times 20 times one times 360. So once uh, 360 plus 40 plus zero equals 400. So the only place you see numbers, their calendar count, how do we know that the trade count existed? Um, Aztec documents in particular. Um, we, we have seen on the same pages of codices, uh, Aztec and Mixtec, or even earlier Mixtec that overlapped the Maya period, they would count, you know, tribute, you know, okay, this tribe sent 600 Quetzal feathers, that would be in trade count. However, on this day in the calendar count, that tribe sent that trade count of eight 600 Quetzal feathers. Yeah? Um, it is, but it ain't. The seeding day, the seeding day, in other words, the technical first day of the month is a zeroth day, the seeding day. That's what it's called, the seeding of ish, the seeding of pop. However, the seeding day simultaneous is the primary beginning of the next month whilst signaling the formal end of the previous one. Because the first day of the month is the zeroth day. Yeah. And you count to 19. That's 20 integers. Yeah, it's 0, 20, but, but then if that 20 is the same as a 0 the next one, yes. it's only going to be 19. Mm -mm. One point, only be Not quite. <laughs> that, and, and in fact, that concept is about the most difficult to get across. So initially, I will tell students the zeroth day of a month is the first day. We'll start with that premise, and then as they learn more, as, the, as we get into it, then they learn that it's actually, there's, there's a concept of overlap happening there. Yeah? Wouldn't the way to think of that be as a month is 21 days? Hmm. Because the, the zero is the first, yep. and it runs zero through 20, and 20 and zero overlap. So um, you think of a month as being 21 days, even though it's almost, only 20. Almost, almost. Yeah. Remember, zero, in other words, we number our months like this month of October is 1 through 31. However, if the Maya had a 31-day month, it would be numbered 0 to 30. We still have the same number of integers, right? Yes, and that's kind of so, what I was getting at. Right. So, um, so the zeroth day, the seeding day, in other words, the, zero, the zeroth day of a, of a month never bears the name of its predecessor month. Mm -hmm. So if we end the first month, we go from 19 pulp, the end of the first month, then it goes to zero woe. But zero woe is the end of pulp and the beginning of woe, there is an overlap. But I, but I advise people, when you're getting into this, keep them separate. It's the only way your mind's gonna get around it initially. Because if you start getting into mental gymnastics with yourself over the concept of an overlapping day, you're gonna end up with nothing but trouble. So. And it took me, it took me years to understand that. And, it, and I had to have the Maya, you know, living Maya people tell me that in Spanish. I don't know how they did it, but they did. OK, so um, always calendar related. Few exceptions, but not many. So here we have the periods. So uh, keen, we now, OK, keen is a day. Everything is multiples of days. Then we come to the biggest period, the normal period, baktun. However, it goes beyond that. 20 baktun equals a piktun, just shy of 8,000 years. A kalaptun is 150,000 know, 150, some odd years. A kinchiltun is over 3.1 million years. And an alaltun is, well, that's when the dinosaurs disappeared that long ago. <coughs> the dinosaurs disappeared one alautun ago from our current day. So we're looking at 63 million years. And um, it doesn't stop there either. We found monuments that take this to 30 places. 
I mean, uh, I think they were trying, when you have a life, average lifespan of 34 years, even a, even a, even a cartoon of 20 years seems long. So uh, the calendar count, so day, month, year, times 20, times 20 more. Okay. All right. So how do we, how do we figure this out? So the introductory glyph and this symbol, this symbol stays, but this one changes. And it means blessed is the patron of the hop, the current patron. And it pertains to what time of year it is. Then we have the five places. And then we have the 52-year calendar round. Um, that's my birthday. It's my talk, so I use my own date. And um, that's how we decipher a long count date. The first day of the current long count, um, this is always referred to. In fact, it's carved a lot. So here we have, and by the way, when, you re when we're reading Maya glyphs, they're always in pairs. So we go here, diagonal, here, diagonal, here. And in multiple, in multiple columns, it's always two by two by two by two columns, diagonaling your way down. So 13, zero, 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 zero. Aha, see the four dots? And eight konku, five plus three, right? That corresponds to 13 August. In fact, I can show you the next slide. Hey, move it, will you? What happened here? A toolbar came up. I don't want to see that. There we go. All right. OK. And so some mathematicians over a century's time worked it out. And uh, computer studies and astronomical data pretty much uh, center on this date as the beginning date of the current, of the current uh, part of the calendar count, the, the current uh, the five place calendar count. And it also appears in the Dresden Codex, which is an almanac of Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Moon, and Sun. OK. Now, I'm just going to go into this very quickly here. We have many different ways of indicating numbers. We can be very straightforward, 13, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Did you know those are numbers? These are two stelae or monuments in the same city. In fact, these two stelae are 50 meters away from each other. This one was meant to be read by just anybody. You think that one was? Do you see the, do you see the symbol in common? OK, calendar date. And so. You'll just have to take my word for it. 9, 16, 15, 0, 0. Probably the most complicated number inscription by any culture in any time period ever. OK, yeah, there it is. OK, and I just described this. This is how we read these. And if you're confronted with huge panels of these things, they're always read uh, by column diagonally, across and diagonal. OK? All right, now, uh, look, I mean, I, I've already given it away here. OK, initial series, right? This is the date. Blessed be the patron of the hob. What's that? Yeah, nine. And we have two bars and three dots. 13. OK, now, um, that flower petal-like thing, that's also a depiction of zero. You see it three times, don't you? Yeah. OK? And then we have the ahau, eight, and eight. Yeah, eight ahau, eight kankin. Here is a tomb painting um, from, Rio, from Guatemala, the ISIG again, I-S-I-G. Uh, this one's a little bit more straightforward, isn't it? Okay, this is the moon, this is the god of the day, the god of the night, the lunar phase, the uh, solar progression, and finally we come up with the, uh, with, the, uh, count, with the day of the month, and finally all the way at the bottom is the 260-day uh, calendar. They, uh, were very, they often inserted all this extra data in there just to make sure everybody knew that they knew what they were talking about even if you didn't. So. 
Okay, now, this is an actual monument, a, a ball court marker, and there's the ISIG, and when they're in circular, they always read clockwise, without exception. The Aztecs would mess you up. Whichever way the glyphs were facing was the way you would read it. So if they face left, you read left. Uh, but the Maya, it was always you read right. So there's the uh, ISIG. We have nine. Can anyone make that out? Seven. Seven. Seventeen. Yep. Twelve. And? Fourteen. Fourteen. Okay. So there's, now this is the uh, 260 day. That's the, uh, the day ish. Eleven. Eleven. And we have the symbol sots. What day of that month is that? Seven. Seven. Right. See, you're getting it. Now, I want to just very quickly show you how we do this. So um, and, uh, this, is, this is the only PowerPoint that has too many bloody text slides. I hate text slides. But sometimes you can't get around them. So we, uh, to convert a long count date, write out the five numbers. Factor out the five place number into base 10. The, add the correlation constant. So we get something called a Julian day. Then we use a table that I hand out to uh, find the Julian day century, then subtract that number to get the, in other words, whatever that number is, you go for the Julian century that's shorter, you know, 500, 600, 700, or whatever. Subtract that number to get the days left over, divide the remainder by the solar year to get the year total, and then there's a, then uh, you, you're, you're left over with a decimal, and from zero point, from, from point oh oh two seven, which is January 1st, to um, 9989, which is December 31st, and you can find the day. So um, it's, all, it's, it's horribly algebraic. And so uh, we're not going to go into that. That's nasty. So OK, so the long count day total plus this correlation constant, constant that was figured out for once and for all in 1932 and, convert, and confirmed by computer, we get the astronomical day a Julian day, which is a whole bunch of days all added up. We do a conversion to get our calendar date. That's how, that's how it works. It is not, it is very, it is that straightforward, but it ain't that simple. Okay, so let's just bring this up. Baktun, Katun, Tun, Huinal, Kin. Calendar round numbers, what are they? Okay, there they are. So we got that information. And it also it really helps to write it out in Arabic so you don't have to go mucking around dots and bars. OK. So now we factor out that five place number to get the total count of days. So you're handed this handy little chart. And if, I feel not, if I'm nice to you, get a calculator. And if not, you start multiplying longhand. And so there's the multiple. You know, 9 times 144,000. We add up the days, and then we end up with how many days have passed since 13504 Ahau 8 Kum OK? And then we factor out, so we've just factored it out in base 10. That's all we did. And now we add the correlation constant, which is A. This is the equation. Long count plus correlation constant equals Julian day. I know I'm talking fast, but I want to get to the long scales here. So whatever that is, OK, there's our, there's our, there's our number we're going to work with now. Then we take that number, forget the table, you don't, you don't have it. And um, OK, so it's closest to but greater than that turn, of the, that turn of that century, that almost turn of that century. So we subtract, there's the, there's the remainder. Now we use the remainder to find that calendar year. So we now know it's in the 6th century CE. And OK. So, 91, little over 91 years, there's the date. The last thing we do is we refer to another set of tables to find out what, where in our 365 day year is that decimal. So, 17 May. Now, if the year we come up with was a leap year, like 590, we subtract a day, it's 16 May. And, but if it's not a leap year, then we leave it. So in this example, so that ball court 
monument was dedicated on our date, that date in our calendar. So that's how that works. We're not gonna, we're not gonna muck around with that. That's really, this is where I'm really getting mean because we have to go into factoring, lowest common denominator, and dealing with 13s and 20s. Okay, here we are, this is the fun part. Um, there are extreme long count cycles. This is a step in Yashilan, which is in the southern part, uh, near uh, south, uh, it's toward Guatemala. And so, one, two, three, four, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, and then we have, and then it goes. So there is, so there, remember that uh, five place? The common five place number, we've added to it. So, and this one also does not have the, this is the year glyph on it. But when you see, when you see a bunch of stuff like that with a bunch of 13s, and it, it, it was carved, it had to be a calendar date. Okay, now um, there are, now we've uh, since discovered, uh, when I put this together, there were five stones that had these super long counts on, they're longer than even Yashilan. There are, we now count 22 of these inscriptions. Uh, and not just in Koba, we found them at Ushmal, one at Palenque, two at Tikal, three at Yashilan, and three more at Kirihua. And um, so on the edge of those big stelae are, all, is all this. And um, so, uh, and in fact, Kinik Janab Pakal, Lord of Palenque, um, he had inscriptions in his tomb to indicate he was going to return one week after the turnover on October 2nd, 4772. So October, mark October 10th on your calendars. He's coming back. <laughs> and um, so in other words, that was one of my arguments against 2012 business. If the Maya were convinced that the world would end, why did they, why did they factor in advanced dates? In fact, they didn't even have a verb that meant end before the Spaniards came in and the Christians mucked things up for them. Okay, there it is. What the devil is that? Well, that's, uh, that's the beginning of our, of our current five place cycle. However, it, uh, what this indicates is that this five place cycle we've been talking about is actually much longer. In, in other words, this is how many days have elapsed since the real beginning day. So, uh, okay, this is how we do it. Good thing the last four calculations are easy, isn't it? Okay. All right, then if we divide that by the solar year, okay, there's how it builds up. Visuals are great, okay? So, um, and instead of writing all that down, we'll use a viniculum. We'll use 13, so here's our, okay, one, two, three, four, five, plus uh, the, the uh, pick tune, the next period up, and then everything else is indicated by a 13 with a line over it. So the blue dates are all dates that are carved out that we have seen, including 21 December 2012. Came from a, uh, came from a monument uh, south of Mexico City. And however, the glyphs, we couldn't read them when it was discovered, but reading them now, this ends a Baktun period and begins the next one. That's what it says. Boy, I, and that, with that information came out in 2011 and did I use it? You betcha I did. Okay, so. Question? Yeah. Now, what dates oh. represent? You mean the, these back here? Yeah. Okay, this is the beginning of the current fifth world, according to their theology. In other words, they had a very rudimentary concept of evolution. There were four previous worlds, and each one was more advanced than the other, and each one was destroyed because they either pissed off the gods or did bad things or whatever. Um, it should go down really well with the end timers now. And we are, st we are in the fifth world. In fact, the Aztec referred it to the, as the fifth sun, and that is a Mexican colloquialism, the fifth sun, i.e. current times. So, and these are all dates that have been found carved out on Maya monuments. Uh, these others have been figured mathematically 
uh, uh, this one appears in a span, uh, by the way, I should have highlighted that one. 15 June 1224 appears in a Spanish document. That was uh, the Franciscans were talking to the Maya, and they uh, converted that and found out what that was. So, um, and um, this ends, now by the way, you notice we're not through this. This is one single Pictun era, yeah? So are those Bakhtun dates? Is that what those are basically? Yeah, up to here. Okay. Then we've added the Pictun, because this is a Pictun period, 20 Bakhtun. And this is all the rest of them that you can think about or not think about. But let's keep it easy. So um, 21 December two years ago was this. Plus that. Plus that. And because 13 is not an ending number, that was the, that, now, yeah, the New Ages really didn't like me showing this one. And, um, and, um, okay, so, oops, I'm going back. Why am I going backwards? Because I'm handling this wrong. That's why. Let's go forwards. Okay, so that big number, the beginning of the current era, is since the real beginning, that many solar years since that date. We have found this date written in Koba, and, um, and it, just blew, it just blew all the archaeologists' minds because everybody thought that they were just intimating eternity. And then somebody goes and excavates an inscription that's got that thing sitting on it. And um, OK, however, OK, here we have today's date. In uh, long count, it's uh, you know that five digit. There's the. Uh, the uh, year and the 260-day uh, calendar, otherwise known as this, otherwise known as that. And here it is in the Aztec calendar designation. Um, all right, we ain't done yet. How long is this grand cycle? OK. OK, that beginning of the current cycle. The final day in this system will be that. Add one day, what do you get? <laughs> Our universe is not going to be around by that time. It predates the Big Bang, and it po postdates the uh, heat death of our universe. So, and then when it turns over, it's just going to start another ultimate grand cycle. That's it. Any questions? <laughs> Any answers? <laughs> yeah. What is the significance of the number 13? Uh, 13 is the number of full moons you see in a given solar calendar year. And in fact, Triskaidekaphobia, only Europeans have it. No other culture on Earth had it. 13 is a sacred number to Chinese, Australian, you know, the Bushmen, people in the Kalahari. Um, Inca, Aztec, Maya, uh, Wampanoag, uh, uh, you name it. Every culture on Earth, except European Caucasians, revered the number 13, which is probably why the European Caucasian Christians hated it. I would, I would advance that as a, theory, as a hypothesis. I use the word, as a scientist, I have to use the word theory very carefully. And um, so, um, uh, 30, uh, 20 is the number of fingers and toes you have, and that is also common worldwide. However, people found, uh, the Egyptians started counting in base 5, and then they took it, and the Mesopotamians counted in base 60. It's the Mesopotamians, that's the reason we have 360 days, 360 degrees in a circle, and 12 and 24 hours in a day. That's their fault. They've been in jail. And, <laughs> About 12, any, any given time is about 12, um, you know, making Arizona license plates. So, um, but, um, but you know, we, I mean, my own family trace on the European side traces back to 1570. God knows how long the Aztec that that first forebear married traces back. By the way, it was not a noble. They were gone by then. And so, um, 
I mean, and it's, I mean, any Mexican family can trace back three centuries and think nothing of it. And in fact, before we start talking blue bloods, we have a saying, no se puede de vivir debajo del uh, árbol de familia. You cannot live under your family tree. So uh, in other words, it doesn't matter who your forebears were, doesn't make any difference. <laughs> so I love quoting that in Massachusetts and Connecticut and places like that. DC. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. Well, um, I think outside of any more questions, I think I'm done. Thank you very much, RP. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.